Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Um, we didn't get any drinks tonight. Do we need to get drinks before we get started? <laughs> Actually, I think that's a good call. <laughs> okay, never mind. We're gonna we're gonna pause here for a moment, and we will be back with alcohol. Yay! And we're back. Sorry for the wait, but that's that's better. Yes, much much better. All right. Um. So we we went simple. I tried to talk him into a real cocktail, but ah, little, wasn't having it. A little whiskey in the glass with a couple of cubes of ice. I'm straight. Yeah, he took up a lot of space with that couple of cubes of ice. You could have done without that. <sighs> All right. Well, anyway, um, I guess you're, you're probably going to be the one that's better off in the end because it's probably going to get warm in here before we're done. <laughs> yes, it is. There's <clears throat> no air conditioning in here No. while no. we podcast. Well, I turned the AC off because you can hear it too clearly over the microphone. And yeah. That's irritating. So uh, anyway, well, we there's... Uh, there's plenty to talk about tonight, and we're going to try and go another way, because um, if given the opportunity, I will only talk about foreign policy for the entire <laughs> existence of this podcast, but I guess not everybody wants that. So, um, foreign policy's good. I, I am, however, going to start with a little update here and there, yeah. Venezuela and Iran. Um, and actually, with Venezuela, there's not much else to say about what's going on in the country except that there is still kind of calls to like move troops down there um i i don't think that that's gonna happen it yeah. seems really unlikely to me at this point it really just kind of given just the general feel of what's going on right now it just feels like we've kind of backed off venezuela and we're looking set our sights towards iran yeah i mean it, and it really is kind of amazing that that you can take I mean, we so had our eye on Venezuela, and what's it been? A week, two weeks? Now it's like well, I don't we're know. This so... all started in January. Well, yeah, but I mean, just given like since the the last big push in Venezuela, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's been a few weeks. A few weeks, and now like it's immediate. Like now, there's a big port push towards Iran. Like it's crazy to me. Yeah. Well, um, that being said, though. Uh, Venezuela is under siege, but it's their embassy in DC um, <laughs> yeah, that's under siege. The um, it was either yesterday or today. I I forget the date, and I didn't write it down. But I saw the article today um, that uh, law enforcement officers of the Secret Service and the State Department actually broke into the Venezuelan embassy in DC today and arrested. Uh, the last of the American citizens that had been invited in by the embassy staff to help defend against the U.S. government, which oh, is wow. insane to me <laughs> in the first place. So That's interesting. Just to make this clear, what's been going on is that the Venezuelan embassy in Washington, D.C. has been under siege by the U.S. government. Yeah. Um, they uh, The U.S. government was trying to evict Maduro's embassy staff uh, from the Venezuelan embassy and hand it over, hand over the embassy to Guaido's supporters. Really? Um, now, this is absolutely, like, unquestioningly against international law. <laughs> uh, the embassies are sovereign territory, yeah. and they're supposed to be inviolable. Um, so, And I didn't realize that. I, um, before you had mentioned that the other day when we were talking— I didn't realize embassies were actually sovereign territory. That that's actually a little piece of Venezuela right here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the, uh, embassies everywhere are supposed to be protected. The yeah. the host government um, has an obligation to protect embassies. Interesting. And uh, well, our government wasn't. <laughs> our host government isn't exactly being. <laughs> following those rules yeah and so there were a bunch of uh american protesters that had gone and essentially picketed the embassy to try and keep the u.s government u.s law enforcement out wow um of the embassy and uh the the embassy staff had invited them in to help it it, it sounds crazy every time i say it to help them defend their embassy against the u.s government wow (laughs) right Um, So apparently the U.S. government broke into the embassy today or yesterday and and arrested the remainder of those people. They haven't managed to to turn over the embassy, to my knowledge, at this point. But, 
I mean, they they were literally the embassy has been under siege by the U.S. government. They've yeah. uh, they'd cut off power and water. Um, they weren't letting any supplies in. They were actually arresting people that were trying to deliver food to the embassy. Wow! So they basically put it under siege, mm-hmm. like a medieval siege, <laughs> like a medieval siege, which yeah. is the same thing. Yeah. Interestingly, that we're doing to the country of Venezuela, actually, <laughs> yeah. and uh, to Iran as well. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Um, the idea has been to cut off all, cut off everything. Oh, cut it all off. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, like nothing in, nothing out. Right. Uh, so that I, I just find that really interesting, and um, we had better hope it would be like if after the election, you remember uh, the UK. Uh, banning Trump from the country. Oh, yeah. I, I think it actually happened before the election results, but yeah. um, that they they had banned c- Trump from the from the country. Yeah. Um, and uh, so imagine if after the election happened and Trump took office and was trying to move his staff into the U.S. embassy in London, okay. um, and that the uh, the UK government had said. No, we don't accept the results of your election. We don't think that Trump is a legitimate president. Uh, we think Hillary won. So they tried to evict Trump's staff, staff. And, and install <laughs> Hillary's staff in the U.S. embassy in oh, wow. in London. Imagine if that had happened. Yeah, and that's basically what this is. Yeah, so we better hope that we don't set a trend here because I imagine yeah. there's quite a few countries that would be pretty unhappy with our government and... Mm-hmm. Um, choose to replace the existing embassy staff if yeah. given the opportunity. Absolutely. So Craziness. Yeah, it's just, it, it's unbelievable. Uh, yeah. And if you want more interest, more information on what has been going on there, uh, if you go to Scott Horton's show a um, couple of weeks ago, or maybe early last week, uh, he did an interview with Kevin Zeese, uh, who is one of the, the people that was there at the embassy Oh, really? Trying to defend against the U.S. government is really interesting. What he had hmm. to say, I was listening to the interview and I thought this can't be real. Yeah, well, that's what that was my initial reaction when I saw because I watched a a video I found somewhere and they were talking about basically how we were laying siege to the in, in, embassy, cutting off the power, cutting off the water, and and not letting anybody in and out. And I was like, this can't be right. That that can't be. Certainly, it seemed to me that if that was really going on that the media would have picked up that I would have seen because I watch enough news mm-hmm. and it was never there. And it's, and it, I look, this happened. Like, I mean, it's, yeah, it's yeah. not, it, it's just nobody's covering it. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, I saw no media coverage of that at all. Yeah. I saw a little bit in international news, but maybe, not much. yeah. I mean, I didn't, I didn't catch it on any of the international stuff I follow, but it wouldn't surprise me. You'd see it there. Yeah. It was very brief. Yeah, it was more like uh, in the ticker though, not like oh a story. yeah on the ticker. Yeah, yeah. I mean um, a lot of good stuff ends up in that ticker. I'm just saying. Oh yeah, I, I make it a point to read everything that comes across on the ticker on uh, France 24 before I actually get out of bed in the morning. Right. I, I turn it on from the bed and I sit there and I read through until I'm reading the same ticker stuff and then I get out. <laughs> right, that's a smart way to do it. Um, and then in Iran, we're still. Uh, you know, war drums are pounding still. Man, um, pounding, pounding hard. And uh, I have been encouraged somewhat by seeing. Well, I haven't been encouraged by the first part, but I've been encouraged <laughs> by the second part. Um, seeing Bolton get out there and talk about how you know we're going to put maximum pressure and so forth, and we're we have plans to send you know 120 thousand troops and Trump to go out there and say, yeah, that's not real. <laughs> yeah, we're not doing that. <laughs> um, so it has been encouraging, at least, to see uh, Trump get out there and contradict Bolton. Now, it frightens me a little bit that it seems Bolton at least believes that he has the reins of foreign policy. Yeah. Um, but at least uh, Trump's been going out there and contradicting him. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping that Bolton pushes far enough that well, Trump finally says his famous words. You're, yeah. Well, and that's something that. If you look historically, at least in the Trump administration, that's kind of what he tends to do. Like he'll he'll start breaking with whoever's kind of on the fence to leave publicly, and and when you start when you see him break with somebody like that publicly, usually the writing's on the wall that there's fixing to be a change. Well, man, now, I don't know that that's going to be the case here, mm-hmm. but man, it would be nice. Yeah, fingers crossed. Um, I, he now Trump has offered negotiation. 
I mean, yeah. he's mentioned more than once that if they want to call, yeah. that he's willing to deal. Yeah. Um, and he has, uh, like, somehow through Switzerland, um, like, using Swiss mediation to have the Iranians contact him or something. I, and I did say this from the beginning, that I, I felt like that's really all Trump ever wanted to begin with, mm -hmm. with this Iran deal. It was one of those things, he went in so hard against Obama that he wasn't going to embrace anything that Obama has done. Yeah. And I think that if, if there had been a renegotiation, that they could have not really changed much and him jump right on board with it. But him being the personality that he is, mm -hmm. he's he's not just going to embrace something that was done under the prior administration. Like, yeah, he's just it's and it's obviously a huge character flaw of his, but it's the way he is. Mm -hmm. Like I just I think that if they had had renegotiated it when all of this came up to begin with, that all of this could have been avoided then. Yeah, I was reading something from uh, a former. State Department official, admiral, something or other. You know, I'm terrible with names. I, yeah. I didn't write it down. So, <laughs> so, uh, so you don't have it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, admiral something or other, um, yeah. who was saying we hadn't had any real communication, like direct communication with the Iranian government since the 80s. Oh, wow. Um, and that, you know, even in the depths of the Cold War, we yeah. were at least communicating with the Russians all the time. Like we had yeah. direct communication and that um, he was concerned that anything that happened that everybody would react badly because they they have no idea what's going on on the other side because there's no communication yeah. right so, so um, hopefully this won't won't progress very far but they're certainly looking for an excuse yeah I mean it seems clear to me and I this one while I don't think that we were sending troops into Venezuela yeah um, I don't think this one I'm less confident about yeah I, I I think they'd be a lot less hesitant I mean we've already and we've already got so much on the line there. I read the other day that um, we pulled all, I guess, non-essential people out of Iraq. Like yeah. they, they pulled everybody out. Like they're gearing up. Like it's, yeah, it's, it's something's going to happen. Yeah. Um, I, I suspect that you're right. And that's very disappointing. And I hope that everybody will like contact, contact your representatives, contact your senators and at least press them to move to, have some kind of a vote yeah. in Congress since that's constitutionally what's required before we go to war anywhere. Yeah. Um, at least make them have a public debate about it. Yeah. Uh, instead of just allowing the executive to make these decisions and do what they please. Yeah. And I think we're going to see something. If nothing else, we're going to see some kind of strike over there or something. Like I said, I don't, I don't know if we'll see boots on the ground, but we're going to end up bombing some Oops. shit over there. Like I can see that. Yeah. Um, let's see. What else do we have? Uh, the next thing that we wanted to talk about was tariffs. Oh, yeah. So, you're always pressing me to do more economic stuff. Um, and so, tariffs it is. Yeah. And this is a good one. We've been, uh, you know, arguing with China all this time. And every time they the negotiations seem to be going somewhere positive, then Trump does something stupid and adds additional tariffs kind of breaks things down. Um, I, yeah. You know, I'd like to think that it's just, you know, more of this kind of hard-nosed, bombastic negotiating tactic thing. But yeah. the truth is that Trump has been talking about tariffs from the from the campaign trail. Well, he's a believer in tariffs. No, he really thinks he, that he it helps the He has been talking economy. about tariffs since the 80s. Well, that's I true. I mean, if you look way back in the archives, like, he, he this is something he truly believes in. Mm -hmm. Like, right or wrong, and I, mean, I think we're fixing to take it apart. Yeah. But I, it's, I, he's a believer, though. Um, the, okay, so in the entire... In the whole of modern economics, like since Adam Smith, the economists have, on the whole, agreed that tariffs are never positive. Yeah. All right. Well, it's essentially a tax. It I is. Mean, it's absolutely a tax. I mean, it's not... Yeah. Well, and what tax truly is positive? I mean, can you name... I mean, as far as economics are concerned. Now, mm -hmm. now I mean, you can you can say, well, you tax that money and you give it to somebody else and that person's better, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. But that's never a positive for the economy. Yeah. Well, and that's the case here, too. Tariffs um, hurt the whole to protect the few. Yeah. Uh, they, they just serve uh, special interests. Um, and... 
So, like, starting, going back to the Adam Smith thing, uh, he made the point in Wealth of Nations, like, the the origin of, you know, the, I guess, this academic discussion of capitalism, right? Um, he said that it's the, in the interest of each individual or family, or government, <laughs> um, et cetera, uh, to buy from whoever produce, produces the needed product at the lowest price. Absolutely. I mean, and, and that... Like, I, I, I don't think that really needs argument, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's, you know. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, you look at your own pocketbook, you know. I mean. Um, so tariffs, and Trump's into the protective tariffs. So he's yeah. he's using tariffs to try and boost American industry. And yeah. because the American economy is doing fairly well based on the statistics that they're that they're using, um, he is saying, well, it's because of these, these tariffs. Yeah. Um, from what I've been reading from you know, business insiders, it seems that they're, what they're saying is that, you know, thank goodness we got these tax cuts to help offset, offset the tariff, <laughs> the tariff. issue. Um, I, I, just, I don't, I have trouble swallowing that. But, I, you know, I'm gonna, I want to try and work through, like explain very simply, you know, why tariffs are a problem as much as I can. And it, it comes down in many ways, to um, what Bastiat called the seen and the unseen. Um, and that's actually what he defined as the difference between a good economist and a bad economist, is that oh, the, yeah. the bad economist only sees the immediate <coughs> results, uh, the things that are that are apparent to everyone, and the good economist like works out the other things, that, the, underlying. the stuff that doesn't happen because yeah. of this, yeah. essentially. Um, and he had a, a really great example, which I'll come back to, but... Um, Let's just assume that a tariff already exists. Okay. All right. We'll start from there. That seems like an easier case to to do from the beginning. Okay. Um, so if uh, if a tariff is removed that protects an American industry, say um, the American textile industry, yeah. let's use cars. Cars is good, right? We have like cars. car competition all over the place. Right? Yeah. So um, if uh, if a automobile tariff is removed. Uh, the first thing that happens is that employment in the American auto industry will go down yeah. um, because they can no longer compete at the same level. The, the purpose of a tariff is to raise um, comp- com- competition's prices to a level where the American business can be competitive. It's, it's Essentially, competitive, what yeah. it says is that the uh, overseas versions are less expensive. Yeah. And so people are choosing those because they're less expensive. And so we'll artificially raise the price in order to make American um, automobile makers competitive. Absolutely. All right. So let's say we have a, a protective tariff for the automobile industry and it's removed. Well, so then the U.S. auto industry, the employment will go down because there will be less demand for their product. Yeah. All right. And so that's, that's where the bad economist stops. Yeah. And they say, oh, well, then we can't remove this tariff because it'll it'll it's gonna reduce so employment. many jobs. Yeah, yeah, all these jobs will be lost. Yeah. Um, but the employment on the whole, like in the other countries that now don't have to pay a tariff to, to export their automobiles to the U.S., yeah. um, em- employment in their auto industries goes up. Goes up, yeah. Because now there's a higher demand for their product uh, because they're more competitive. Yeah. Um, and so the cost for us, the lowly consumers, yeah. everybody who's buying an automobile, the cost goes down. That's a win for us. Yeah. Right. The cost goes down for all the consumers. So now, given a, a certain amount of money, yeah. right? let's say that you had $30,000, and that's what a car cost before the tariff was removed. And now the um, overseas competitors... They're able to sell without the five thousand dollar tariff. We'll say they're able to sell their cars for twenty five thousand in the U.S. So the American automakers selling their cars for thirty thousand, they don't get to sell as many cars. But the foreign automakers selling their cars for twenty five thousand, they get to sell more cars. Yeah. Employment goes down in the U.S. Employment goes up in the in the overseas markets. Uh, but now the American consumer, instead of having to pay thirty thousand dollars for an automobile, only has to pay twenty five thousand dollars for an automobile. Yeah. So when he's done with his part of it, when the consumer's done with his part of it, he has, with his $30,000, instead of an automobile, he has an automobile and $5,000. That's going to move its way into the economy. Right. So he has leftover money to spend that'll boost other industries Yeah. Um, who will 
increase their employment to keep up with the higher demand for their products. Yeah. Right? Um, and so the the total employment, as you look at the whole big picture, uh, total employment isn't lost. Um, but total production increases yeah. because everybody's focused on the thing that they can produce the most of with the least input. Yeah. Right? Everybody's using their, their resources more efficiently. Yeah. Um, and so that... That's why tariffs are are never well, good. And you and you end up with resources not just going into thin air, because that's kind of where that's kind of where I see that five grand going when it's going to the government. Yeah, well, and that's the other thing. Like nobody, the only the only group that wins with tariffs is the government. They're yeah. the ones that are collecting that money. Yeah. And you know, Trump's out there saying that China's going to pay all these tariffs. No, they're not. The consumer's going to pay the. Well, that's the just tariffs. it. The you pay for that. Like it's. It's not like those companies overseas are going to be like, oh, well, we just got to bite the bullet. and Yeah. Uh, the, the Chinese companies are going to still sell their product at the same price for them with the same level of, uh, of profit. And, and all the this... only difference is that the price for us goes up. Well, and, and what it really means for us is the price of that cheap Chinese stuff mm-hmm. is going to go up. So now we're going to be paying more for cheap stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean... Eliminating tariffs forces each industry to produce where its production is the most efficient, where it can get the highest output for the lowest cost. Yeah. Um, what you're doing by adding tariffs is actually you're skewing the economy in such a way. You're making it less efficient. And so um, the other thing that it does, though, you talk about uh, that, well, now the auto, uh, the people that work in the auto industry, it'll drive their wages up. It might or it might not. But even if we assume that it does. Yeah. What they can buy with those wages goes down. <laughs> so the purchasing power of their wages goes down. Yeah. Um, they're unable to buy as much with the same level of wages. So even if you increase their absolute wages, the purchasing power goes down. Is lost. At, yeah. at best, you've got a wash, and you've probably <laughs> eliminated some of their purchasing power instead. Yeah. Um, so they just can't buy as many things, which depresses the whole economy. Um, and so, the, you know, this is... Bastiat used the uh, the idea of the seen and the unseen. He he gave the broken window fallacy, and this is a kind of thing. Um, this example is something that you hear like whenever there's hurricanes, and yeah. they talk about how uh, how good this is. You know, it'll it'll it's produce, gonna be good for the economy. Yeah, 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 it'll be good for the economy. All this destruction. Well, yeah. destruction is never good for the economy. <laughs> I mean, we can make the same argument for war, but I'm trying to avoid that for the rest of the podcast. Um, yeah, but uh, he. Uh, the story he told, and this was me late at night rereading Bastiat stuff last night. It's an exciting night in my household, sipping whiskey and drink, and reading Bastiat. Right. Sounds um, like a good time to me. <laughs> but uh, he had the broken window fallacy. And um, I-, I won't use the same, the exact same numbers that he did because it was based on 19th century France. And yeah. so, but um, let's say that a baker, and I'm pretty sure these are the, the industries that he used. Yeah. Um, uh, a baker's son has an accident and breaks a window in the baker's shop. All right. And so uh, he says, some may look at this and says, well, the, the window maker, um, this improves the economy because now the window maker has a job to do that he wouldn't otherwise have had done. Yeah. And the baker will spend $100 to replace this window. Um, and in, in the window maker employs you know the people that install it and everything else, right? So all Feeds of these this people, industry. yeah, all these people benefit, right? And that this is a net positive because it's a purchase that wouldn't have been made otherwise. Yeah. Well, okay, that's true, Maybe. but you gotta you gotta go beyond that. So the baker has a hundred dollars now that he spent on a window that he would have spent that he's now unable to spend on something else. Right. So, uh, like reinvesting into his. Yeah, like maybe, reinvesting maybe into his thing. Buying another piece of equipment yeah. or, or fixing a piece of equipment. Or there's all, I mean, yeah. that, that money was going to get spent one way or the other. Yeah, he could be improving his equipment or hiring more people to produce a greater output. Yep. Um, I, I think the example that Bastiat uses is that he needed a new pair of shoes. Yeah. Um, so we'll say that he needed a new outfit because that makes more sense. Actually, you, you can get a pair of shoes for a hundred dollars these days, certainly, but easily spend a hundred dollars on a pair of shoes, but we'll say he needed a new outfit. 
Um, well, in this example, now he doesn't get to to purchase that outfit because he's put that hundred dollars on the on the window instead. Yeah. Um, whereas if he hadn't had to buy the the window, he could have spent that hundred dollars on a new outfit, employing the tailor and all the people that that work for him. Yeah. Um, instead, but here's the big difference, right? Is in the end of the first scenario, the baker has a window. And the window maker has a hundred dollars, yeah. but in the second scenario, the tailor has the hundred dollars instead, yeah. and the baker has a window and a new yeah. outfit. Yeah, he hasn't lost anything in this process. And in fact, wealth has been created. Yeah, right. absolutely. Um, <laughs> so all, all tariffs really do is they are artificially raise the price of goods, forcing the consumers to divert time and or money to something else. Because there's no point in buying what you can produce at home for less. Yeah. <laughs> right? Um, so if you if the tariffs raise the price of something, now you're forced to either spend that money towards buying the product from somebody else because, you know, the prices have gone up. You're, you're forced to spend more money or you're forced to spend your time to produce it at home. Because yeah. maybe now it's cheaper to, to do it at home than to buy it from somebody else. Yeah. So either way, you, you've had to divert resources elsewhere that could have been used more efficiently. Um, Mises, uh, Ludwig von Mises, who's, you know, the, the um, beginning of Austrian economics as we know it. And we have the Mises Institute here in Alabama yeah. at Auburn. Yeah. Um, member of the Mises Caucus. Yes, and yeah. The Mises Caucus. The, the Mises Caucus and the uh, Libertarian Party. Yeah. Well, um, Ludwig von Mises said, uh, all that a tariff can achieve, this is a quote, by the way, quote, all that a tariff can achieve is to divert production from those locations in which the output per unit of input is higher to locations in which it is lower. It does not increase production, it curtails it. Yeah. End quote. So, I hope that we've made a reasonable enough <laughs> case as to why tariffs are never a good idea. Yeah. Um, never a good idea. It's just better to let everybody produce that which they have the the greatest advantage in producing. Yeah, I mean, has there ever been? I mean, there's. I know it's pretty well as long as you go back. There's always been tariffs here in the U.S. Right? We've always used. Um, the government was originally funded by tariffs. Yeah, but they were like one or two percent. Yeah, so they're it's a really very tiny small. number. Yeah. Um. And it. Well, the again, the consumer is paying that money. Yeah. It wasn't income tax. There was no income tax. There was no income tax. Yeah. The the yeah. only taxation was was through tariffs, goods moving into the country from outside. Yeah. And so it, they weren't protectionist. Yeah. It was just like a little it bit was, of. It was a way to fund the government. Basically. Yeah, essentially, and it's yeah. it, it was essentially a consumption tax in a lot of ways because yeah. it's the it's the um the people that use those inputs. That yeah. had to pay the tariff in the end. Yeah. Um, so the industries that use the raw materials are the people that purchase the finished goods. Yeah. Which is, I still don't approve of. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just to be clear, but yeah. um, it, it was a small number. But it wasn't what it is now. Yeah. 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 Well, now, um, well, the, the government to... is projecting that they're going to get something like $88 billion from tariff collections in the next year. Really? Yeah. Uh, and that's on top of the 350, um, or no, three and a half trillion dollars that they collect through uh, taxes, uh, like you know, income taxes and property taxes and exactly. um, yeah. business taxes or corporate taxes and what have you. Yeah. Right. So, um, the it, it's just it's just added money into the government coffers, and it's at your yours and mine expense. Yeah. Of course, they need that money, obviously, to fund. They're already at a tremendous shortfall on their budget. <laughs> I was to and, say, it's not like the debt is as huge yeah. as it is anyway. And uh, it, it's you know, it's not like we're going to convince anybody that they should just spend less instead of collecting more. Well, I mean, that's where we would be. We would be in the camp of you know, live within your means. Mm -hmm. so, but that's never going to happen. Yeah, it's not likely. We have, not, to have to have a big change. Um, actually, before we move on to our last topic, I, I just wanted to comment on that really briefly, the live within your means thing. It made me think of, um, I got in a discussion with somebody the other, the other day that's just like a, a real Trump hater, um, and said that, 
that while he's a libertarian, right. um, that whoever was running against Trump, that's who was getting his vote this year. That he just Period. wanted Trump out of office, so he was going to vote for the the Democrat no matter what. And yeah. I, I pitched uh, Jacob Hornberger, and he was like, nope, doesn't matter. The libertarian <laughs> won't win, so I'm just going to vote for the Democrat. I just want Trump out of there. Yeah. I was like, all right, well, fine. But I, I assume because of this that you want to change. And what I would say is that why am I? Why wouldn't I vote for the lesser of two evils? Like, why wouldn't I vote for Trump over Hillary or whoever it's going to be um, over over Trump? Uh, and there is at least one person in the race that I probably would vote for over Trump, uh, were yeah. she to get the nomination. But ah, yeah. um, it, it depends. It doesn't really matter. That's not the point. Uh, the point I was going to make is that um, just. Point to me the real substantial difference in the policies of George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, and Donald Trump. Point to me the real significant substantial difference in the policies that they enacted while in office. All, all of the important things are the same. Yeah, they're all the same. So if you really want to change, yeah. you need to vote for a change. Yeah. Like a real change. Like real change, yeah. Um, and you're not going to get it by continuing to vote either Republican or Democrat. Nothing will change that way. Yeah. If you want something different, then you need to pick something different. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Just maintain the status quo otherwise. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> you really wanted to talk about this, so you introduced I don't, I don't it. know that I really wanted to talk about it. I felt like we needed to given what Alabama has done in the past week. So okay. what – what has happened is Alabama has passed the most strict abortion laws in the country. Um, and they've done this on the idea of trying to force the Supreme Court to take up Roe v. Wade again, or overturn Roe v. Wade. Yeah. And there's quite a few states that have, have passed things kind of like this, but Alabama's is by far the strictest. They, mm -hmm. There is no exemptions for rape, incest. All of that, like it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's, as I understand it, that got removed at the at, at the, the end. end. Yeah, um, and Georgia just passed a, a law, heartbeat um, law. The, yeah, first heartbeat, which happens about six weeks. Yeah, which is about the time where people generally actually no. find out that they're pregnant. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So. So usually too late. Yeah. It's yeah. essentially an abortion ban. Yeah, and like I say, I mean, I'm I'm not really sure how I feel about all of this. I'm I'm very. Very on the fence when it comes to the subject, I'll say. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I don't, I, I would consider myself pro life. I mean, I absolutely think that, you know, once there's a heartbeat, once there's a brainwave, any of that stuff. And that like, happens in about five weeks, I think, brainwaves. Exactly. And I mean, I don't, I really don't see how once that has occurred that you can't consider it a baby. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I have a little bit of trouble allowing the government to kind of enforce that type of thing. Yeah. Well, here's my position on the issue. Um, and yeah, I really wanted to avoid the abortion <laughs> issue because kind of no matter what, you end up alienating half your audience. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's luckily, we don't one, have man. a huge audience, so we won't yeah. really lose a lot of people. Uh, it's, it's a very passionate thing. People have very strong beliefs on this one. Well, and that's a good point there, too. I, there is... There is a problem with the way we discuss this issue, yeah. and it's true of a lot of issues now, but um, this is certainly one of them where uh, each side ignores the nuance, yeah. um, where the right says that the left is a bunch of, of uh, baby killers, and the left says that the right doesn't think that women own their own bodies, and that's not the argument that either side is making. Yeah. Right? There's, a, there's a, a, a bunch of space in between. Um, the left is making the argument of choice for the most part. They're been some at the political level some pushes that make you think that not everybody's looking at it this way but the yeah. the general public on the left um is saying that you know there is a point through the first trimester give or take um where it's not an independent life they yeah. don't think that they're killing a baby they're not going out there to kill a baby they're they're saying that you know that this isn't a life yet, yeah. and that the you but know man, the, the you, woman having control of her own body can expel what is essentially a parasite. 
Yeah. Right? Well, they um, would. I think they would call it a clump of cells or whatever. Yeah, but... but uh, you man, know, you have to be really invent. You have to really believe that because if you're wrong, yeah, you're, you're a true. baby killer. I yeah, mean. well, but that's the argument that's being made. Yeah, I mean, agreed. they're they're not arguing yeah. that they that they should be able to kill babies. Yeah, again, there are some uh, weird elitist levels that are making exactly that argument. Yeah, that, but, yeah, exactly. Um, but for the most part, yeah. you know. The, that's not the argument that the left is making. And yeah. obviously the right isn't making the argument that women don't control their own bodies either. The yeah. right is making the argument that this is an independent life yeah. and therefore has the right to life. Yeah, exactly. Um, that you can't take that life away any more than you could your neighbor. And and I've, like I say, this is... One I know plenty of parents that would say that they should have the right to abort their children up until about 14 or 15. <laughs> I um, think it's more likely at those ages. <laughs> I say that as a parent. Yeah. <laughs> so, but no, I, I like I say, I, I, I couldn't advocate for a pro-choice position. I mean, I just, I, I do, I do have a problem with the government telling you you can't do anything. And the part of the problem is, is that, that abortion is accepted amongst a great deal of the public. And here's where my problem comes in mm-hmm. is so much of the public is okay with this, whether it's okay or not. Yeah. If you ban it, it's just going to push it underground. And is, is that better for society is the question I have to ask. Mm-hmm. And maybe it is, maybe you do ban it and enough people are like, okay, well this is for real. We're not going to do this anymore. Yeah. But history well, doesn't people... really tell us that though. Yeah. Well, there are some people that advocate it as a form of birth control. We see, and yeah, which is a, it's a problem. I would say, yeah, I would absolutely um, say. That's now, a on, on the other hand, it, they also make it really difficult to adopt a baby. Yeah, hell, I gotta deal with a home visit to adopt a kid. <laughs> <laughs> that's insanity. <laughs> like the kitten's just happy to get out of the cage. I'm pretty sure, <laughs> right? Uh, but and they're everywhere, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's really difficult to adopt a baby. Yeah. And I think if you made it easier to adopt a baby, that there would be a lot more mothers that are willing to take to term to give up the baby for adoption. Yeah. Um, there would certainly be a higher demand. Well, and that's uh, the big pushback, at least with the Alabama ban that I'm hearing, is that the state has no infrastructure to deal with the consequences mm-hmm. of this ban. If you just start all of a sudden making all of these people who don't want these babies keep them yeah the infrastructure well, they'll just, just go to florida or wherever well they I will mean, uh, but it's not it's not going to stop people no, from having no abortions. but the idea of the but the whole idea behind the ban though is to force it to the supreme court and so if they if they truly got everything mm-hmm. they wanted within a year or two we'd be in well, alabama alabama's law would be law of the land well i mean that true. is the goal well here's my position on the whole thing and it, it echoes a lot of what you were saying is that I I know that life begins somewhere between conception and birth. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, well, there's no question about that. <laughs> right. Life begins somewhere between conception and birth. And I have yeah. a biology background, but I still don't feel comfortable yeah. determining when that when is. When that is, yeah. Um, and I sure as hell don't think a bunch of attorneys in state government or federal government are in a position to make that make that decision either. I, I'm really uncomfortable with the idea of the state defining when life begins yeah. or what constitutes life. Yeah. Um, and if you think of some historical examples of the state getting to decide similar kinds of things, like um, states getting to decide what constitutes sentience or not, or yeah. humanity. I mean, just think of the yeah. slave trade. Well, exactly. Um, so if, if you give the state the control of this kind of things, I, I, I just... I just well, see it as being very dangerous. Insanity would be another one. Like, I mean, True. who's the government to decide who's sane and who's insane? Yeah. Because then we're all insane and we're, we're all have just... to address gun control soon. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a fun one, at least. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, my, my beliefs on that are not as mm-hmm. vague as they are on this one. Yeah. Well, um, I think that th- this can be done without the use of the state. Now, I, I think, yeah. for my part... I don't advocate abortion. I consider myself personally to be pro-life. I wouldn't. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend to anybody that I knew yeah. to have an abortion, and I would this. try and talk them out of it. Absolutely. Um, that being said, I think that this is a decision to be made between a family and their doctor. Yeah. 
um, that those those are the people that are in a much better position to make that decision, well, and those are the people that have to live with the consequences. Absolutely, and and just to add to that, like part of a, a big thing that kind of gets not talked about is you know, I mean, what if there's what if it's like a high risk pregnancy? You know, I mean, because I'm just going to tell you if it's a choice between my wife or the baby, mm-hmm. that's not a hard decision for me. It's the wife every time. Yeah. Well, um, my um, my parents, before I was born, didn't go to the nearest hospital mm-hmm. because the nearest hospital uh, had it as a blanket policy that if there was a complication in the pre- pregnancy and they had to choose between the wife and the baby, they chose the baby. Yeah. And my parents intentionally went to a hospital where that decision wasn't this it was the opposite yeah um where they could save the the wife instead of or the mother instead of the baby yeah um they did that specifically yeah um and and at first when the like the, was it virginia uh yeah. that recently virginia, did the thing that well, was like up started, to term essentially well, it, was up, it was in new york but virginia i think there was they did the was, same thing was, right? yeah followed right behind them yeah but new york led with that yeah but virginia was the weird one because that's where the governor went the governor said some weird stuff yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so i like i would like to believe that they made the law the way they did to protect doctors in those kind of cases yeah we had a complication during delivery yeah and the doctor chose to abort the baby to save the mother yeah um because if you have a real strict abortion law that's a problem yeah, it, yeah. it's definitely a problem um now so i don't have the answers yeah. uh th- there's no doubt that i don't have the answers i know where i personally stand but um as far as where the government has control over it i also know where i stand there too yeah. and I, I think that there's other options there's private organizations can can take some control over this. I mean, you have the American Medical Association, the American Association of Physicians, etc. I yeah. mean, all these groups are the the ones that that you know give out licenses and so forth for practice. I mean, they can determine best practices yeah. and and define from a medical standpoint what's what by some kind of consensus. Yeah. Uh, you know, when life begins, and if people are violating those rules, they can take away licenses and so forth. Now. Yeah. In my perfect world, their lack of a license wouldn't actually prevent them, <laughs> prevent from, them from doing anything. From practicing. <laughs> yeah. um, but it should have an impact on you as a patient about whether you want to go there or not. Um, I don't know, man. Times are tough. I got to get that, yeah. that cheap medical care. <laughs> yeah. Everything you want, $5. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so... I mean that's that's where I stand on it I I suppose yeah. and that's not that's not a real strong stance but there is something that I, I'll tell you this too is that things like the New York and Virginia laws and the way um, some people that are very vocal about this are are talking about it it's yeah. actually pushing me more towards the pro life position and saying yeah well apparently you can't be responsible with this decision so we're just going to take it away from you well, and i think that that's unfortunate i think a lot of people are feeling that way i think that the pro-life is well gaining. we're in the deep south i don't know well, that yeah that's, that's true. Uh, no well yeah i mean that's the yeah <laughs> most the stance people is what the stance that, is yeah. down here like yeah, it most people changing. felt that way already but um, but and that's that brings me to another thing on this though is what's wrong with just having letting the states decide yeah. And just letting it be a state issue and not a federal issue. Well, it's supposed to be constitutionally anyway, I yeah. suppose. I mean, it depends. Like, <laughs> again, it comes down to the question of whether it's life or not. Which is, And so that makes it not really a state issue because it is the federal government's responsibility to protect life. Yeah. Um, well, the protect natural rights, natural which includes, rights. Yeah. you know, the, the root of it all is the right to life. Yeah. Um, so it, it's a tough question. I... I would propose this, though. Like, I keep hearing this interesting euphemism of reproductive rights. you got to protect women's reproductive rights, yeah. which I don't know if they see the, the irony in that, that the, the right that they're trying to protect is the ability to not reproduce. But um, anyway, I was thinking that we propose a, a counter euphemism. All right. um, instead of reproductive rights, why don't we talk about reproductive responsibility? Yeah. Hey. I mean, like, you can make the same argument, right? Like, you can still say, I don't see why men should be making decisions about women's reproductive responsibility. Yeah. But it doesn't have quite the same sting but, but, when you say... Yeah. That <laughs> takes a lot off of it when you phrase it that way. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and I just have to point out, and I, I, I'm sure I'm not the first person to 
to joke about this, but um, you saw Alyssa Milano's thing, yes, right about yes. well, we need to withhold sex, and I, I just thought that that was that was really funny when you're talking about withholding sex to to um, you know stop the prevention of abortion, and <laughs> especially in light of the idea of reproductive responsibility, right? right. And so well, you have to we... wonder if she sits there and she goes, oh, okay. Well, it turns out we had the ability to prevent unwanted pregnancies the all whole time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it turns know. out we have this power ourselves. <laughs> yeah. So I, I thought that that was I thought that was funny. Oh, you uh, can't you can't escape the irony of it all. Man. I know, man. <laughs> Alyssa Milano. When I was like twelve or thirteen years old, I was yeah. totally in love with her. She was like the hot girl from Charles in Charge or Who's the Boss or whatever. I can't uh, maybe, remember I anyway. She just she was like she was. Yeah, the smoking hot teenager when I was a teenager, and she's nothing to me but the name I've heard th- tossed around a lot. Yeah. Like I don't, I don't remember Who knew her. She from... was going to become so crazy. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't remember her from anything myself. Um. So, do you, uh, we have anything else? Is that we want to call that a wrap? I got a quote I can end on too. Hey, well let's let's hear right. let's end on the quote. But first, I am curious what you think of my new my new euphemism, the reproductive responsibility. Ah, I like it. Yeah, let's start pushing that. <laughs> I think, so I think, everybody out there, yeah. start talking about reproductive responsibility. Yeah. I, and I think that's something we can all get behind. Yeah, with no other which side of the argument you're on. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So I'm gonna yeah I, I wanted to see what your reaction would be. That's why I wouldn't tell you what that was. Right? <laughs> yeah, I like it. Um. So uh, this one's uh. uh Quote from Bob Dylan. Oh, all right. Good old Bob Dylan. Nice. Yeah, we're not going back to the Founding Fathers. We're, <laughs> we're going back to 60s folk rock. Um, he says, uh, I think of a hero as someone who understands the degree of responsibility that comes with his freedom. Nice. Yeah. Way to go, Bob Dylan. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's going to do it for us tonight. Um, we'll be back in a little over a week, right? They, we're planning about 10 days before we can record again, I think. Um, yeah. So, hopefully you'll you'll join us again then. Um, in the meantime, uh, follow us on Facebook. Please like and share. Um, we you know Get certainly like to there. draw more attention to what we're doing here. And uh, you can uh, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, leave reviews, and I think that's all I've got. Is there anything else that I think that I think that's it? That's everywhere we are. Of course, there's yeah. also the the libertymike.com. We we actually do have a website oh, yeah. where we where we post these things too. And I have been meaning. I'm really bad at finishing articles, but I have been meaning to put one up about the um, uh, about the electoral college. Ah. Um, because there's just been a lot of weird talk about that, and it seems to me that people really don't understand what the purpose of the <laughs> Electoral College was. So um, hopefully I'll actually sit down for a little while this weekend and, and get that put well, together. We, we got a little break between shows. Maybe this will be the opportunity yeah. to get Well, that you know down. how I am. I get about like 75 80% through with an article, and then I can't figure out how to finish it, yeah. and then it just sits there and it never gets done. And it dies. Yeah. Just, I, I need to find somebody that I can send these things to and say, just tell me what my closing sentence is and I can <laughs> I can work backwards from there. Yeah. Um, but uh, from now until then, uh, everybody try to stay free. Later. Ciao.